Can I tell you something? Before I got saved, I had nothing to rejoice over. Life was what it was, and I just went through day by day. So when you found your place, Philippians chapter 4, let's stand together. Philippians chapter number 4, let's begin our scripture reading at verse number 1. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Wouldn't it be great that somebody knew your name was in the book of life? He said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Our dear, gracious, heavenly Father, We are thankful for the privilege to stand in the house of God to proclaim your truths. We pray today, Holy Spirit of God, for all that are listening. May you speak to every heart that we would get to hear something special from heaven. For every time we open God's word, we look and we listen for you to enlighten us about maybe not only a new truth, but to remind us about the truths that are in the Word of God. Thank you now for this time together that we have honored you by being here today and to sing the songs of Zion. How thrilled we are to sing to you, for you're so worthy. Now we pray in order to worship you this morning, oh, how we need you to take control of the service. Speak to our hearts. Show us, Lord, wherein we have specific need here today. You heard the prayer request. We ask you, would you please, in Jesus' name, touch everyone. There is none more special than the other. So we do pray that you'll have your will and way in all these requests. Thank you now for this time that we get to spend together. Help us to do thy perfect will. Bless now. Speak to my heart first that I might be a help to those that are listening. Thank you again for what you're about to do for us, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Thank you for your standing. Wow. God is so good to all of us. I'm so glad because in the day in which we live, we don't hear a lot of good things that people talk about. We talk about the weather, we talk about politics, we talk about the news of our day, but sometimes we just don't talk about the most important things of our heart. It's going to be one of two things, and I hope it's in this order. Talk about the God we love and serve, and then we can talk about our family, how that God has blessed us, ministered to us, and and taken care of us so many wonderful ways. I would like to take your hearts back to verse number four, if you would please. I want you to notice this verse of Scripture. Before I read, let me tell you what our title will be for us today. And I've probably changed it a couple of times. But I believe I've settled on this thought. Being delivered from worry. Being delivered from worry. 
Now, my plan was to go another message on worship because I've gotten about six or seven together. And, but I thought about, Lord, I know I've picked this out, but what is it that you want to share with us today? What is it you want to share with me? And as you share this with me, I pray that, Lord, I will apply it to my heart. And I would like to say to you today that I just don't worry. I cause other people to worry, but that's not the truth. Because when things happen out of our control, some people say they don't worry, but they get concerned. And I think we should be concerned about prayer requests and health and family and uh, doctor's appointments and the things that we hear and the things that we know. And because I know as well as you do, things that are going on around us is not always right and holy. All kind of things. Children are being stolen, snatched right off out of their homes. And I've seen some crazy newscasts uh, in this past week and I'm thinking, People are either bold or crazy or both. That they don't care about stealing packages off your porch, stealing your children right out of their yards. So would I be safe to say today that we are no doubt in the last days? We are in those days. And oh, as we begin to read about the things of the last days, it looks like the newspaper of our day. All the things that we were said come to pass are happening. And there's lists that we could read in 2 Timothy. But today I thought, let's look at a subject that God has laid on my heart about worry. And I know it's a character trait that humans have. Uh, some worry less than others and some worry more than others depending on circumstances that go in and out of their lives. Now, when we have someone in the hospital and the news and the prognosis is not good, oh, we tend to worry and pray a lot. But through the scriptures that I'm going to show you here this morning, uh, God has promised me and you that we really don't have to worry. Now, if God is true, and he is, and he is the truth as we know it, and he is, then according to the promises, there shouldn't be anything that I should have to worry about. Worry tends to say, I'm not sure you got this. I'm not sure you're going to work this out in a timely manner. So I'm concerned so much, not only am I praying about it, but I'm also worried. The things we see and the things we hear makes us worry even more. My wife and I were talking yesterday about where our society is. And I said, you know, we used to be shocked when we heard specific news. We would just be appalled of how can that happen in America and so nowadays we're getting so inundated with bad news, we don't hardly appreciate good news if and when we hear it. How desperately do we have to get or how strong do we have to get not to worry? And especially worry about the things that are happening right close around us. You know, when they're happening in California, I go, eh, oh well. But then when it begins to happen in Alabama, I go, hmm. And then if it happens in Decatur, we go, wow. And then if it happens in Priceville, I say, oh me. So the closer home these problems get, the more attention we need to be paying. And God has told us, that we don't have to worry. Can, can, you, can you hear this from heaven? Either you trust me or you don't. Either you believe in me or you don't. 
Either you think I know what I'm doing or you don't. What if God was to say to us audibly, why are you worried? Does my time frame scare you? Because you know, I know all time. I have all time and time doesn't bother me. So in the human realm, we know how long an hour is and, and oh, how well we know what 24 hours is and then seven days in a week and then a month and then a year. We think, man, that's a long time. And the minute we get to the end of the year, we say, where did the year go? That was so fast and so quick. It's like, what has happened to this past year? Well, according to God, we don't have a biblical reason to worry. Now, I'm concerned about a lot of things, but I haven't lost sleep in a long time worrying over anything. Uh, I've learned no matter what state I'm in, like the apostle, they're with to be content. It's not hard when God meets your need I might not have all the extras, but I guess that's not important anymore. As long as we have something on the table and something on our back and the heat unit works, air conditioning works in the summer, I'm pretty easy to kind of get along. But back in verse number four, I want you to look at the command from God. He said... Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Thank you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Well, Lord, thank you for that command. And he said, I'm not real sure you heard me. And then he said, and again I say, rejoice. But you know, if I just had something to rejoice about. I want to give you, I think, about four thoughts that I think biblically, scripturally, will help us not to worry. Number one, we're going to look in verse four, and we just read where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say unto you, Rejoice. So number one is to rejoice in the Lord. There's another word that we could use in this rejoice would mean to re-stir something that I have. Now, I thought about the other day when you, you go to make something like when ladies make bread or they make a, a, a wonderful dinner or supper and they put in all the ingredients well, I best, in my understanding, can understand about lemonade. Lemonade, you can cut lemons and cut lemons and cut lemons, squeeze lemons and put them into a jar, and, and then you can begin to add all the sugar you want, and then you pour in another ingredient, which is called water. What do you have? You have components. Well, I thought it was, it's not lemonade yet. So what happens to make these components work? You get a stick, and of course not this big like a paddle, but you get a stick and you stir and you stir and, and then those components begin to match up and real soon you have lemonade. So I can understand that those components thrown together doesn't automatically say you've got lemonade. Well, you can pour it out to drink, Brother Tom, but it's going to be really strange to the taste because you're going to get a lot of lemon or a lot of water or a lot of sugar. Well, we're told to rejoice in the Lord. Some people feel like, but you just don't know what I go through. Well, God knows what you go through every day. And do you remember the Apostle Paul where he spent most of his life? In prison, being beat, shipwrecked, being stoned. I mean, my goodness. And he's telling us, 
Rejoice in the Lord. Now, since God has commanded you and I to rejoice, and then he said, and again I say, because I don't think we probably read it and grasp exactly what God has commanded us to do. So how many by the raise of hands has ever just got ticked off? Go ahead, be honest. Do you know when we get ticked off, we can't rejoice? When we get ticked off, that means I'm just beside myself. I don't like the way things are going. I don't like the way things have happened. I don't like something that I can't change. So sometimes people get us ticked off. Can I tell you today that it's a sin to be ticked off? Now the Bible said, oh, the Bible said, be angry and sin not. Can you understand how hard it would be to be angry and not sin? You'd have to go get in a corner with a dark room, put tape over your mouth, and not say anything. So, have you ever met anybody that's just grumpy? I mean, they're just grumpy. They think that if they smile, their face will break. They don't have anything to be happy about. And you know what they like? They want to make you grumpy too. And can I tell you this morning, being grumpy is a sin. Boy, it's getting quiet in here for sure. I didn't say I was with you this week and you were grumpy. But being grumpy doesn't show the glory of God. It doesn't show a rejoicing heart as well. It's kind of like lemon and water and sugar. They're just three components. But then, boy, when it gets stirred up, Kind of like us when we get stirred up. But maybe you thought you didn't have anything to rejoice over. Well, I've jotted down a couple of things. Look at what we have in Christ. Number one, I'm heaven bound. My sins have been forgiven. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Not only that, the same Spirit lives in me that raised Jesus from the dead. Do you understand what power is flowing through our bodies? And we also have the ability to be everything God wants us to be. Why? Because God said he wants his will in our lives. His wonderful spirit desires to do for us what we do for ourselves. I'm so glad that God is long-suffering. But God has told me in this verse, he has commanded me and you to rejoice. There are folks in this world who think their life is the life of a critic. You ever seen anybody, no matter what you say, I just got a new car. Well, I'm glad I don't have the payments. They're just critics about everything. Do you know a critic cannot rejoice because they're too busy criticizing? They don't like what the blessings everybody else has. And you know, if we can rejoice in our hearts, we can then rejoice in the blessings that God blesses others. Why? We are commanded by God to rejoice. There's folks that just have sour outlooks in life. They just don't like nothing. No matter what, no matter how good, they just complain about everything they see and hear. Just don't find anything to rejoice about. They haven't been happy in a long time. They had no reason to smile nor rejoice even if God commanded them to do so. And God did say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. 
So number one is to rejoice in the Lord. Number two, look in verse number six, no, verse number five, excuse me. Verse number five said, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. I think about the work of a moderator. I've been in enough meetings, some business, but I want to use the reference of when we've had preacher conferences, mission conferences, and we usually have a moderator that basically sets up and runs things and controls. So the moderator lets us know the order of everything and who and what and when, how long. So the moderator is in control, whether it's the president of a company whether it's the vice president or whatever, who's ever going to control a meeting would be called a moderator. Now, the moderator being in control of services, discussions, or even behaviors, and these moderations bring about being calm, temperate, and in complete control. You ever thought this thought? What is it that controls me? He said here in verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. And can I tell you this today? You are telling people what controls you. Somebody say amen. You are letting people know what controls you. I think I've heard this said that in this life there are billboards everywhere. And the billboard is there to advertise for somebody, companies, businesses, or maybe restaurants. They are there to give us information. Do you believe today that our face is God's billboard? We are letting the public know what's in my heart because normally it comes out on our face. They see when I'm happy and they see when I'm unhappy. Well, the Bible said rejoice in the Lord. Does my billboard say that? Does it express who's controlling my life? Well, it probably doesn't take long when you get miffed, bent out of shape, or upset that your face will tell everybody who's in control. And some people say, well, the devil made me do that. Maybe not. Maybe what was on your heart just found its way to your face and out your mouth. So it's hard Sometimes to have the billboard that says God lives here and he's in control of my facilities. He said, let your moderations be known. Let folks know who's controlling you. And the reason being, he said, the Lord is at hand. Does folks hear you and I today and by our conversation, our character, do they know the Lord is at hand? I know most people have heard this statement, Jesus is coming. Yep, they've heard that. But do they know from my life that I'm trying to encourage you that Jesus is at hand? You see, everyone is being controlled by something. I hope and pray that it's the Holy Spirit doing the controlling. Our face will tell what our heart's trying to say. And there's so many things that people do not mind letting folks know. We've just about passed uh, football season. And there's people when you see on TV a football game, painted up, unbelievable, they're painting their billboards. I remember the Green Bay Packers, everybody wears a cheese slice on their heads. Is it any doubt who they're pulling for? 
I see them standing in the stands, snow on the bleachers with no shirts on. Numbers painted all over them. Faces painted up like, you know what they're doing? They're advertising who they're pulling for. I thought about this yesterday. I thought, wow, if we were to paint our face for Christ, what would it say? What would it say, I've been forgiven? My home is heaven. You see, we, we don't seem to advertise for God like we'll advertise for everybody else. Gospel tracts do a wonderful way of advertising. A kind word goes a long way with the billboard saying, Jesus lives here. Jesus is in my heart. He said, number one, to rejoice and he said, and again, I say to you, rejoice. And then number two, he said, let your moderations be known. Who is controlling you? Number three, if you'd look with me in verse number six. He said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, stop right there, You've already said a mouthful. You said, number one, everything by prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Well, thanksgiving is already passed from last year, but we don't have to have a special occasion and a special dinner to say, I am so thankful what God's doing in my life. I mean, listen, I'm not the president of the company. I'm barely the leader in my home but I am so thankful what God's doing here and now. And I believe if God heard me respond how thankful I am, he would probably grant me more things to be more thankful for those as they come. You see, verse number six gives us the picture when he says, be careful for nothing. It's a warning. It's kind of like this world is choking the very life out of us. There's so much going on everywhere we turn and it's hard to hardly get a good breath each day. Has anybody ever said, this is killing me? <laughs> you know why? Because that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to choke the very life out of us. And I'm afraid to say he's probably doing a pretty good job that used to be a statement that every time I turned around, Brother Tom, I said, man, this is killing me. It's because I realized I wasn't overcoming. You see, there's a lot going on in this world and it's trying to take me with it. The world is tearing us apart. We'll go a little further in verse 6. He said, let your request be made known unto God. I'm going to paraphrase that last part. It says, talk to me about everything. Do you hear that? God said, talk to me about everything in your life. It makes good conversation. And then you give the essence that you need me. You need me to talk. You need me to hear your heart. You need me to hear your speech, your whining, your complaining, whatever it might be, just talk to me about everything. You know what I found out? He said in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, but if I had to put myself under the microscope, I'd probably say I probably do 99% of the things in my life before I pray. I just practice doing. And then when I struggle, I say, Lord, help. Lord, help me. I am I'm really struggling. And there's no doubt why the tend to be worrying about everything. We grew up worrying about our kids when they were babies, that they wouldn't fall and get hurt. We worried about if they were sick. We just, we just tend to worry about everything. 
Well, I think most of us here don't have any toddlers around the house. If we did, they're grandkids. But we tend to be concerned about everything. God said, talk to me about everything. Tell me where you're at. I know. But it helps you if you talk to me about it, then you will recognize where you're at. Look in verse number 7. Let's pick this up with verse 6. And then he said, And the peace of God. There is no one in human history, if they were told, how would you like to have the peace of God in your heart, would say, I'll try anything. Let, and, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. You know what I just read? God said, if you rejoice evermore, you let your moderation be known unto all men, and if you talk to me about everything, then the peace of God will keep your heart and your mind, where do we worry from? Our minds. I just read one of a promise that if I keep these commandments, he said, and I'll give you a sound mind and a sound spirit. I'll help you. I will do my part if we will do our part. You see, God knows that we're sometimes an emotional mess. And God said, I will control your hearts and minds, which is our thinking. And our thinking is where we get in so much trouble. Listen to what Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Again, God's given us a commandment to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. Say, it's hard to be at peace when everything is going down the tubes. Can I ask you this question? Does my worrying stop or increase the world going down the tubes? No. Now, if you and I said, but I'm going to get out there and stop it. Well, if you did, you wouldn't have to worry. Number one, you remember what he said? Restore the joy or restir. Let everyone know that the Lord is at hand. And number three, he said, talk to me about everything. And I hope today you're already there. This is something that is a daily practice. And then number four, look in verse number eight. You can tell we're at the end because it says, finally, brethren. <laughs> look what he says. Whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, here's number four, think on these things. I gave you four things. Rejoice. Let everyone know the Lord is at hand or what's controlling you. He said, talk to me about everything. And then he said, now, think. Think on these things. Well, he said, read all truth, whether it be in speech or in actions, be honest, be respectful to God and man. Follow that which is right. Follow purity and holiness from our hearts. And then he uses the word lovely. This is our mind saying, I desire the pureness, the holiness, the rightness of God. 
and I desire to have a good report. You see, if we do this, we can just forget worry. We don't have to even ponder those thoughts. And then he says for virtue. Virtue is simply the strength of moral rightness. It's what you and I know what is right to do. Find any reason whatsoever to praise God and if you have to, to praise man for something that they do right. You know, it's not hard to say, hey, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate what you do. It's giving them a, a verbal accommodation, just saying, I thank God for you. I appreciate you. Those things are saying, there's something in my heart that's appreciative of what you do. Husbands, there ought not to be a day goes by that we ought not tell our wives how much we appreciate them. Amen. Wives, you ought to tell your husband just how much you appreciate them. I don't know about your husband, but when my wife tells me that, she can make me work myself to death trying to please her more because she said, I appreciate what you do. Well, let me get out there and do some more. You see, when, when we please each other, nothing is unreachable in a relationship. I'm so glad because my father says, why don't you talk to me about everything you're going through? So guess what? I've started practicing that this week. I literally, I've been invited him in the car. I invited him the other day under the car. I had to work on it. I said, I need you to get under here with me. I need your help. I want to tell you, he got under that car with me because I only have two of these and I needed two more. And I'm going to tell you within 10 seconds of asking, of course, after much frustration, Brother Tom, God got under there and seemingly held the other end and helped me and I said, thank you, to the glory of God, hallelujah, got out and kind of did this when I stood up. Thank you so much. And I said, wow, now I know a little bit about what the peace of God is. When things God just fixes and takes care of. Well, let me close with this. When he says, think on these things, you know what he's saying? Put them into practice. Practice. They do no good just words on a page. But if you think on these things in a form of practice, they will do something. Look at verse number 9. These things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Somebody help me. Do. So it ain't something just thinking about. He said, do. And then watch this. You're going to see the, the role reverse. In verse number 7, we heard the peace of God. Now in verse number 9, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, do we have any reason to worry? When we have the peace of God and then the God of peace with me. There's no need for me to worry and God worry. Since God's not going to worry, why should I? Remember, you could easily say, I'd just rather worry. I understand worry causes stress and stress causes ulcers. And it also probably will bring on a short life. God said, if you learn to rejoice and follow these instructions of the Apostle Paul that I've given him, he was able to rejoice. Look what he said in verse 10, and we're done. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Do you hear what he said? I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Why? He learned to rejoice. 
He learned to let everyone know the Lord was at hand. He learned to talk to God about everything. And then he practiced what he preached. He was thinking on these things. Now, in verse number 11 and 12 is the setup for the verse we all quote. Look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But if you don't know how to rejoice, you can't do everything. If you don't let folks know the Lord is at hand, nah, I don't think we can. But we can finally come to verse 13 and say, oh, now I've learned not only how to be content, but I've learned that I can, through Christ, do all things. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, please. Our dear Lord, we are so thankful for the privilege of looking and listening to the Scriptures that, Lord, there's not a reason whatsoever that I've come up with that I think that I have a right to worry. Since my God does everything and he does them well. He fixes all pain and sorrow according to his perfect will. And he supplies our need according to his promises. So, Lord, I have nothing to worry about. And Lord, I would much rather rejoice. I'd much rather let the people know who's controlling me and, and you're at hand and oh, how desperately that we need to be thankful. And oh, if we could just talk to you about everything. If we could share everything to you, it would make great conversation for us I'm so pleased and then would you help me to put all these things into practice the apostle said well, all the things that you've heard and learned and seen in me do so we can think on these things to teach us how to grow and how to learn I really don't have anything to be worried about we love you with all that's within us if there's anybody here today that does not know you, I can imagine all the years that I worried until I met you. And when I met you, because you said you loved me and would forgive me of all our sin, I pray today if someone is not sure of heaven, would you help them to have enough faith to say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come into my heart and save me. And the best that I know and understand, I'm trusting you for the forgiveness of my sins, to be able to write my name in the Lamb's book of life and take me to heaven after this life. Thank you for what you've done for me. And help us not to worry, for there's no need. Thank you now for this time together. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. Please save the lost. You know, our doors of opportunity to join with us are always open. If someone in here has never followed you in scriptural baptism, would you help them to understand today's the day to submit yourselves to follow our Lord? And I pray if they need a church home, this will be the place we highly recommend. Thank you now for what you're going to do with this invitation. And we're going to thank you for all that's accomplished, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Let's, let's uh, listen to a song.